Can everyone, is this live? Can everyone hear me? You know that she does talk like that when she's not on. Welcome, the welcome. Uh, my name is Kai Bird. I'm the executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography. And over the past 12 years, the Levy Center has awarded 44 major fellowships to working biographers. Each of these fellowships is now worth $72,000, so it's not chump change. To date, some 20 biographies have been published, including Ruth Franklin's biography of Shirley Jackson, which won the prestigious National Book Critics Circle Award for biography. Um, I also want to spread the news about our brand new, wholly unique master's program in biography and memoir. It has just started this autumn with uh, at least 17 students enrolled, which is phenomenal. And Brenda is actually uh, both a former director of the Leon Levy Center, and she now teaches one of the core courses in the new master's program. Um, just a reminder, but our next program is next Wednesday, September 25th at 6.30 p.m. with David Nassau giving the annual Leon Levy Lecture on Biography. Uh, tonight, I'm very delighted to have with us Ben Moser in conversation with Brenda Wineapple. As I said, Brenda is the former director of the Leon Levy Center, and she's all, the author most recently of The Impeachers, The Trial of Andrew Johnson and the Dream of a Just Nation, a very widely reviewed and timely book for our times. <laughs> uh, Ben Moser's book, last book was Why This World, a biography of Cl Clarice Lispector, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Ben's new book, Sontag, was just published two days ago, and it is already an Amazon bestseller, and has garnered long and really quite interesting reviews in the New York Times, the New Yorker, and elsewhere. For instance, in today's New York Times, Parul Segal uh, described it, quote, as a, a book as handsome, provocative, and troubled as its subject. <laughs> Clearly, this is a biography not to be ignored. Brenda will interrogate Ben now for about 40 minutes. <laughs> That's how I always say that. It's not oh, just you. Not <laughs> Good luck it's, a, it's an interrogation of the author. Uh, <laughs> and then they will take some questions at the end. And afterwards, both Ben and Brenda will be signing their respective books, sold by uh, Books on Call of New York City. So, Brenda and Ben, please tell us about Susan Sontag's life. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Kai, Ben. It's wonderful to be here with you in your wonderful new book. It's, um, it's, it's a book for our times. It's going to be, I think, already the definitive word on Susan Sontag. You did an enormous amount of work for this book, and one of the things that's uh, stunning about it is um, the material that you had to go through, the archives and the sheer, I don't even know how many interviews um, there were. Um, and I think um, it's been said, and I think you've told me this, um, I've known Ben, I should just uh, confess for a while, so it's not really an interrogation. I'm a great admirer of your Clarice Lespector and of course this book. and and I consider myself an honored friend, so it's so nice to be here interrogating you <laughs> as a result of that. But I, I, you know, I understand that, um, that you're the so-called authorized biographer. Um, I guess there have been unauthorized books, and I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about what that means for an audience who may not know what that is, what are, what are the advantages and maybe even the disadvantages of authorization, and then we'll get to the Susan Sontag, but just to sort of yeah. start well, with Yeah, well that's that. an interesting question because it's very hard to explain, even though it doesn't seem like a hard concept to me. I was yes. the authorized biographer, but this book is not the authorized biography. I think when you say the authorized biography, it sounds like it got a seal of approval from somebody, or, or ah. you know, it's um, or that it had to be right. signed vetted. off on, it wasn't vetted. vetted. No, um, 
I, I don't think I would have done it if I had had that exactly. because I would sure. have had, um, I think for me as a writer, I have to be independent to exactly. draw my own conclusions and knowing that Sontag was this incredibly um, polemical person who's a fascinating person and who attracted all sorts of projections and thoughts and opinions about her, um, often cor correct and even more often incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't have stepped into that. What happened is I was in, I was actually in, in Rio uh, doing my last, what I thought was my last event ever for Clarice. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, I'm finally off the hook and I can go to the beach or something. Um, I don't really go to the beach that much, just to be honest. But, um, you know, kind of relax, have a nice day, visit some bookstores, which is usually what I do. And um, I got an email saying, guess what? We've appointed you. Mm -hmm. Not appointed, but they, some people, including uh, her agent and her son and her mm -hmm. publisher, had sort of read mm -hmm. a bunch of books and thought that I, my Why This World was something that showed that I could ta take on uh, Sontag. So, but then I had an agreement that, that meant that I could, the estate could look at the book and mm -hmm. comment on the book, and if there were any legal issues, they could talk about that. Mm -hmm. but, they could make suggestions, and those were helpful. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, good. But it wasn't, I, I didn't, I couldn't have written a book yeah. with a censor looking over my shoulder. No, of course not, but did that give you access to the enormous numbers of uh, people, um, yeah. or maybe it inhibited some of those people? It did I, you inhibit, know? Yeah, yeah. I would say um, it definitely gave access to some. Um, following Sontag's death, there was a sort of a rift between her son, David, and her partner, Annie Leibovitz. Um, and the people in their world split into these two camps oh. for all sorts of reasons that I go into in the book. Um, that didn't go well yeah. post-mortem. Uh, and um, mm. so Annie and her friends didn't like it because they mm. thought that I was David's little errand boy or something. Um, so it did, you know, whatever access I think it gave me, it also took it away. Uh, Annie did eventually yeah. speak to me, so that was yeah. good. But I did get access. I think the really exciting thing I got access to are the archives that were yes. restricted. Yes. And that's kind of... That's very exciting because you made tremendous use of her journals in yeah. the book, and it really, you know, you have a very strong voice, and I want to talk about that. And I mean that in all complete positive sense. But of course, Sontag has, herself has a strong voice, and one of the things, one of the motifs in the book is that there's a difference between Sontag's inner voice or personal voice, whatever you want to call it, interior voice, and the voice that she cultivated for the public, even though that changed over time. You know, and I was wondering, in, in coming to put the book together, when did you begin to think about the motifs that you used to understand uh, Sontag's life. In other words, let me just quote you because there was one quote that's really very interesting, I think, and might sort of give us a way to understand that. And you say at one point, you say, a mind's process gives narrative to the writer's life. And so one of the things that's wonderful about Ben's book, and that we want to talk about, it, is the the mind's progress, you know, the mind's progress, sorry, I misread it, I know my glasses on. Mind's progress gives a uh, narrative to the writer's life, and so that you're looking for the way um, she thinks, really, yeah. you know, in that sense. But you have to have a way to develop that for the reader and to, you know, make that explicit. Um, when did you begin to feel that you had an understanding of Sontag in the terms that you um, present her to us? Well, I think it comes back to the question of how polemical she was yeah. and how many opinions were affixed to her. Mm. Um, from the time she was very young, I mean, already in her 20s she, it was the first time that she was featured as a character in a novel. Mm -hmm. So she was somebody that really was, was quite um, fictional seeming to people. And, and they say things about her that are not true. You know, mm. They're objectively, obviously not true if you know the facts. And um, the, one of the things that happens with her is that people, people's opinions are often very negative about her work. And so, just to give an example, there's you know she wrote four novels, 
uh, and it's in yeah. a lot of stories. And it's very easy for people, it's very common for people to say, she wrote these great essays and she was so smart, why did she write all these horrible novels? And there's two ways I approach that. I mean, first of all, I don't agree. I like some of the novels and I think some of the essays fall short. Um, as a biographer, since we're in a biographical setting milieu here, um, <laughs> I'm not the person judging that in order, in the way that like a, a book critic, mm -hmm. looking at just this one book and kind of saying three stars or four stars, that's not the thing. I mean, what's interesting about Sontag is that she's in constant evolution. And mm -hmm. I yeah. had this with Clarissa Spector too. Not all of her yeah. books are equally fabulous. Some of, but, but they become, they lead to something. Right. And so it's that evolution of the right. mind. That's the yeah. story of a biography. If exactly. you don't have that, you don't really need the biography, I don't think. But it's interesting. It's very hard for people sometimes to understand that that people do change over time. We understand yeah. it in life, I think, or right. hope, but understanding it in a book, very often we get a kind of set piece of the, you know, set piece of a person, and then we just kind of um, exemplify that over time. You can't do that with Sontag because she really is evolving. Um, but there are certain kind of, um, what, uh, light motifs throughout her life that are very interesting. And there, I, I, well, maybe we should go back for people who don't know much about her life. I want to get to those motifs, but one of the things, and so I'm going to talk more about with you about her life, and then I want to talk about the motifs. Um, just for people who don't know, she was, um, she's actually from the West, mm -hmm. which many people don't know, and that she lived in so many different places. I mean, she lived in California, she lived in Arizona, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Just give us the kind of background. That's really important. Yeah. Not only that she's from the West, but that she had a peripatetic childhood. Yeah. And that her father died in China, of all places, when he was just 33. And her mother was uh, an alcoholic who was from New Jersey, um, from Montclair, Verona, grew up there, and then moved very young to Los Angeles at a time that Los Angeles is still a little city, right before the First World War. And her mother was, kind of grew up as Hollywood grew up in yeah. Boyle Heights, if anyone here is from LA. It's the former Jewish neighborhood that's right east of downtown um, that was ruined by all sorts of typical urban disasters in the 20th century. And um, her mother and her grandmother, who was from Eastern Poland, came to Los Angeles because they loved the movies. They that's loved a... the this thing that was just coming up, you know, and that from the beginning of the First World War to the end of the First World War became one of the most recognizable and important industries yeah. in this country all around the world. And Hollywood became something that, that was famous, uh, certainly it was famous in Brazil. You know, the first, um, mm -hmm. the first books about Hollywood in, in Brazil come out in about 1913, 1914. Mm -hmm. So already it's gone all around the world. And in Europe it's the same. And um, the mother loses her mother at age yeah. 33. I mean, the mother, the grandmother is 33, and then the father dies. And then the mother is a, a, just an unhappy woman who's very beautiful and very dedicated to appearances. And she goes, she's always kind of looking for a place to be happier. Mm -hmm. um, so she, they move to Florida for a while, they move back to New York, they move to New Jersey, they move to, uh, uh, to Arizona, yeah, they yeah. move to Los Angeles, and then finally, they move to Hawaii, and um, I mean, they, the parents, not, not Susan herself. And so this is really an isolating experience mm -hmm. for children. I think if you know of people who are in the army or, or um, exactly. you know, not only does she not have a father, she doesn't really have a mother, and she doesn't really have any friends because she's being moved around every couple of years. Um, so what she does have, and this sounds like a cliffhanger, but it's not because we know where this is going. What she has are books. Um, yeah. She has the world that is in her mind and her imagination, yeah. and that becomes extremely yeah. important. And, and it's, it sustains itself throughout her life in, yeah. in that way. I mean, Through a very becomes, tough life. Yeah, no, no, and, and absolutely. I mean, it's sort of, you know, when one thinks of Susan Sontag, one doesn't think necessarily, even though she wrote eloquently about illness, somebody who, you know, really suffered terribly, and especially when she had breast cancer, 
um, the kinds of chemotherapy that was available and the kinds of surgery. I mean, it's just really grueling, you know. Well, right? even when she had an abortion when she was yes, very young, that's true. That's the right. way it was illegal and the only thing that you did to, for, the only anesthesia you, you had died. was they turned up the radio loud so that yeah. the people wouldn't hear you scream. Awful. I Awful. mean, that's, there's a lot of that that yeah. people pain. didn't see behind this iconic it's, figure. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. It's pain. It's pain. terrible, Real terrible pain. pain. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, that's, and that becomes an interesting phenomenon that there is an iconic figure, but there's a human being mm. um, that's, you know, living and suffering behind that, you know, uh, very often. And in point of fact, you know, she's evolving, she's changing. One of the interesting things, and I think, you know, it's made much of, and I think it's a real contribution, to be very clear about the fact is when she got, she got married very young, and she barely knew the man she married. I mean, with they the, got engaged he, after a week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. so. and he'd been her, and, and he was a he was her teacher. She was a student, but beyond that, she. I mean, this is really astonishing, and to read it about in two thousand nineteen, um, that she he didn't if he if he was assigned reviews or things to do, she read the books and wrote the reviews. And, and this was, and she was excited about that. She's like, yeah. great. And these guys, who's 27 did. at the time. Women. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't just, like some big eminence with all these yeah, grad students. Too much students time and, to, uh, no. you know, the, 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 you know, time management problems. But beyond that, beyond the reviews, that as I started to say, you make very clear that she was the writer of the book that he became known for, which is Freud: The Mind of the Moralist. You know, and that in private, I think she was very clear about. That's what she had done. Um, but it wasn't publicly known, I don't no. think, at all, right? No, I think one of the fascinating things about this book and about the life is that Sontag seemed, if you look at her on the cover, she seems like this very contemporary figure, even though that picture is 50 years old almost. That's amazing. Yeah, Beautiful but she looks I mean, like she, well, she's, she's very walking down 6th Avenue or something. Yeah. Um, she probably is walking down 6th Avenue. But she's um, actually a lot of the categories have changed so much that it's hard to think back to the times. Um, she does write this book, mm -hmm. and everybody knows she writes the book. I mean, I saw her sister a couple days ago, and um, yeah, and I mean, she was quoted in the Times. She said, of course you wrote it. We all knew <laughs> that, you know. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't something you could really say, and it was funny when there was a piece in The Guardian, they got a copy of it, and they were going to break this big news to everyone that she had actually written Freud, right. The Mind of the Moralist. And all, a lot of the older women that I interviewed, you know, during this yeah, process, yeah. all emailed me and they're like, what's everybody so surprised about? This happened to everybody. Yeah. You know, everybody's forgotten what it was like. We all wrote our husband's books, you know, back in 1948. <laughs> and um, and yeah. There is wouldn't that. think Susan Sontag would do it because well, one thinks yeah. of the present one. No, but one thinks yeah. of you know Susan Sontag in the 21st century, not Susan Sontag. Not that she was born, yeah. you know, in 1933, right. two weeks after Hitler came to power. I mean, exactly. It's not lately. No, luckily. yeah, exactly. Um, but she did it, and it was so funny to see all the outrage among younger women compared to the eye-rolling, blasé kind of. Shoulder shrug. Big deal yeah, yeah. from the older women because a lot of the academic women were very rare um, in her generation. There were very few role models. And I think right. um, since we're in a biographical setting, again, I will feel free to mention Carolyn Heilbrunn's excellent yeah. writing A Woman's Life, who says that girls of her, I guess she's younger than Sontag based a bit, maybe. Yeah, not by too much. Not so. by too much. No. Yeah. Um, but she said that growing up, if you were an intellectual girl who wanted to write or you wanted to be an artist or you wanted to, she said there was only one figure that you could really look to and that was Madame Curie, um, whose mm -hmm. biography by her daughter, who is the only member of their family not to win a Nobel Prize, and her mother even got two. Um, mm -hmm. Her husband, her brother, her dad, her mom, everybody, except for her, but she did write this excellent biography and that was the only thing that girls had to look yeah. to. So. Now, we're so oh, used dear. to like a woman professor, a woman writer, a woman journalist. You know, Clarice Lispector, too, was the yeah. first journalist ever in Brazil. Yeah, and that was in the 40s. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it calls us up short and makes us think, you know, times do change. I mean, there are, there, there are things. One of the things that I, you, I don't think you mentioned this, or if I did, I don't remember. Was the title her title, or do you I think it was his? Yeah. I don't know, but it's very her. 
Yeah, it well, that's like why her. I wanted to ask yeah. that because I love the time, I mean, the mind of the moralist. And the reason I thought that was so interesting is that there's this kind of tension that I feel, and I think you speak of, um, maybe in, the, in those words, between Sontag as moralist and Sontag as almost uh, aesthetician. If, you know, she talks about early on, I think, in a Gensd interpretation about mm. you know, the erotics of art and that we understand art as, as something that's, that's purely aesthetic in some way. Right. And yet, when we think of her later work, um, we think that she, especially when she sort of revisits photography, she becomes herself so clearly a, a moralist. And I think that was always there in a way. I, mean, it's interesting I think it was that, always there. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that that would be the title, whether it was hers or his. I mean, they, yeah. the best, you, worst you can say, they collaborated on it. But she was always interested yeah. in, in you know, sort of the moral response of the artist to, and you make much of this, representation, which becomes interesting. Which is very problematic yeah. and it's very yeah. fun to talk about. If, anyone will indulge me. I can go on about that for a long time. But I think that there's something. I'm here to indulge you. You're, oh, thank you, Brenda. Uh, <laughs> but it's funny because um, uh, her moralism, yeah. she says, I'm a Puritan twice over American Oh, yeah, Jew. that's right, American and Jew. Yeah. You know, so you think, oh, God. I mean, so are we, right? So we know what that's like. <laughs> um, it's not the easiest heritage always because you're always sort of an ideal of moral perfection is held up to you uh, yeah. in a lot of different ways. And I think in America, particularly if you come from the West, I think this is what's important. I write about California's literature. Yeah, no, it's interesting because Gertrude Stein came from the West, yep. you know, and that's a sort of similarity, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah because no, it's, and it's, it's similar because the, the responsibility to live up to this country that you've been given Mm. becomes very, I, th but you, I think you can find that already in, this, in Massachusetts in the 17th century. Oh, yeah. Um, the, 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 you've, God has given you this place. Right. It's the richest country in the world, and you're a little slub, you yeah. know, not quite measuring up. Sontag felt that very keenly, and mm. then she finds it also in the Greeks. You know, she finds it in Socrates, and she finds it yeah. in the Greek moralists, just to come back to moralism. And she really does feel very strongly that morality and aesthetics are the same thing. Yeah. And this is something that she resists in a certain way because Early it's too on, intellectual. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but she's trying to kind of be more, and against interpretation, she's trying to get away. This is another thing that's changed so much that it's yeah. almost unrecognizable. She's basically trying to get away from Freud on the one hand and Marx on the other hand, which are these right, systems that's right, that's right. that were quite oppressive to people, I think, in those generations. Because um, they were so dominant, so overarching, and so complicated. And they did offer you the key to culture. If you could really master Freud, for example, or Marx, you could understand how the world works, how personality and psychology and politics and aesthetics work. But then, already by her generation, those are sort of starting, the cracks are, are right. starting to show. Um, and so she chooses something that was not natural for her at all, which was the sensual approach to art, which was just kind of rocking out with you know her. Right, right, um, right, right. Enjoying music, enjoying painting, enjoying film, enjoying sex, enjoying um, people. It's not a natural thing for her, and it's not really her natural mode. And I think that when she gets back into the moralism, she's on more solid ground. Yeah, it, it, well, it, I, I don't know what you mean it wasn't natural. There's something sort of very exciting about that yeah. that she found, that, you know, that she yeah. was thrilled by it in a way. I think, I, you know, and I don't want to put words in, in your mouth, or, I mean, and you know so much more, but it seemed that, um, that over time she, over time she became less comfortable with that. It was, um, you know, these things are time bound. So against interpretation is very much product, not just of, her and her age, but the age she's living in. And by the time, say, for example, she's going to Bosnia, or even even before that, you know, there's more problematic before that is her trip. You talk about it very, very well, it seems to me, to Vietnam. And yeah. she wrote, writes trip to Hanoi, that she herself maybe is realizing that she needs to rethink some of this pleasure or that she wants to sort of reintroduce 
a point of view into Yeah, it. I think that when you look at this, it's really important, again, to realize how much chain has changed, but also how much did change between In that time. against interpretation to trip to Hanoi. And what really changed was... Now how many years is that? Five years. That's all, right? Four yeah. years. Five years. 61 or... Yeah, it's 63 to 68. Um, but what happens, and something I found really touching that I didn't realize, and maybe it's wrong, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but somebody said to me, and it made sense, that the literature of post-war America, right after, you know, until, uh, until the 50s, mm -hmm. um, a lot of it's about the personal struggle, you know? So even if it's, um, you're living in a country that's won the war, it's the richest and most powerful country in the world, it has all these problems, and yet, it's also the time of the black civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. It's the time of resurgent feminism and um, all this new, exciting American Freudianism that seems to be exerting people to live more free lives and to, um, and, and you, so you have books like Jack Kerouac's On the Road, mm -hmm. you know, like let's head out into the desert. Norman and, and O'Brown. And, yeah. Norman O'Brown, absolutely. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Even Allen Ginsberg, you could sure. say would be part of that. Sure, definitely. And it's kind of, but it's kind of about you. It's not really about society. I mean, it has society in it, but it's really about yeah. exploring yourself. And then you have the great triumph of the new generation symbolized by John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, 1960. 1960. Mm -hmm. So not to, spoiler alert, give anything <laughs> away, but he is killed in 1963. Um, no. I'm sorry, I know, oh, I should, so it's upsetting. in the book. I should say that, you know, I, I should just get people curious. I skipped that part. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. But the death of Kennedy, um, which um, is something that's, yeah. I mean, it's close to a lot of people, it's close to me also because my mother almost saw it happen. She was from Dallas and um, she saw him right before it happened in downtown Dallas. And um, I, I know exactly the street and the time, and it's a really specific time, and it's a, you can trace it to the minute where America kind of snaps. Yeah. And what happens almost immediately after that, well, indeed, immediately after that, Lyndon Johnson becomes president, and then Lyndon Johnson continues and escalates the war in Vietnam, which is something that my father always says is the biggest difference between my generation and his, is that mm. when he was in college and when he was a young man, all he thought about was getting the drafted draft was and getting draft. sent to Vietnam. Yeah. Um, and there's a darkness that settles over America that I don't think we've ever really gotten rid of um, that comes out of that time in Vietnam. And so there is, you know, it's it, just one second about the against interpretation. She's yeah, no, experiencing all this sensual art. And she says in this essay 30 years later that it seemed normal that there was a new masterpiece every week. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's so exciting, but then that excitement uh, goes, it becomes a nightmare, yeah. really. Well, especially by 68, especially 68. by trip to Hanoi, yeah. and you're in the height of the Vietnam War. And, you know, you, you talk about that book, really, I think, very well. I'm not so sure that people are familiar with it. It was a big deal at the time. It was, yes sort of up there with Jane Fonda going to It was funny. <laughs> um, Vietnam, wasn't in the it? I Ken mean, Burns documentary about Vietnam, which I watched, is like 24 hours long or something. I didn't watch it, sorry. Um, um, didn't say that on television. No, but it's okay, too. because I, 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 it was fascinating to see that degree of detail. Yeah. Because, of course, you sort of know there was this horrible massacre war that went on and on and on and on and on and on. And when you even watch it over 24 hours, you feel the anxiety of it. But in 1968, she was invited by the North Vietnamese government to visit Hanoi, which was the most heavily bombarded city in the world and which was this uh, communist dictatorship. I mean, you should say that um, as well, that she fell for completely yeah. because... I think she was so disillusioned with her own country. And she was very far from being the only one. And she wrote this right. essay in which she's really struggling to reconcile the Vietnam that she's read about in the New York Times, which is a metaphor, which is a description, a yeah. narrative, and the actual place that she's seeing and finding that she doesn't really know what people are talking about. Exactly, yeah. She doesn't understand their language. They all look kind of the same to her. And she says, do I look the same? To them. To them, because like in America, people see that I'm different, I have a personality, I have a name. Mm -hmm. um, here, I'm just 
some, you know, am I a tourist? Like, what am I doing here? And she really wrestles with it in the pages of that essay mm -hmm. in a way that make it, um, I think, really compelling. And again, when you're talking about watching the progression of the mind, yes, mm -hmm. even in the pages of that one essay, um, you see that. Yes, yes, yes. Because it was this kind of distancing, too, that's... Um, well, she's trying. Yeah, but not quite there yet, it seems. Well, she's trying. Know. She sort of thinks, okay, I should be objective about this. I should write it this way and not that way. But it's very rare for Sontag, actually, to have that kind of dramatization of what she's looking at yeah. in the text. Well, that's interesting, because one of the points I think you make in the... And it's an interesting point that you make in the, in the biography, you know, I think... Um, which is that she's not comfortable really writing in the first person and that the way, especially as a biographer, biographer slash critic, because in a sense you're both, and I don't mean critic in the sense of criticism, but one who has a kind of point of view about her own work, is that we learn a lot about her and the way she's thinking um, through how she writes about other people. I love that. I, it's I, your you idea. I guess it is, yeah. Um, thank you. I love um, the credit I'm getting from Brenda here. It's true that when you read her profiles, yeah. which become very famous, because she's the first person to write. in America to write about all these mainly European authors, That's right. often not translated, people that she learns about in France or in Europe. Um, and so she was always reputed, one of her great social and, and I think, um, functions in the literary cultural ecosystem was that she would tell you about the new person in France or Italy right. or somewhere at a time when France and Italy were a lot farther away than they are now because books come on Amazon in two days. <laughs> um, it's hard to imagine how far away Paris would have been in her time. But um, I mean, it took a week to get there, you know, on the <laughs> boat when she went with yeah. Philip. You know, it, it was far away. <laughs> so, and yeah. so um, when you have these portraits, these are fascinating portraits, and it's really one of the really interesting things about her contribution. But I think that w one of the functions of a biography is that when you look behind it mm -hmm. and you think, oh, so that's why she's so interested in the Bulgarian mm -hmm. theorist of crowds. Um, it's because... He's sort of talking about the exact same thing that she's going through mm -hmm. at that moment, whether it's intellectually or amorously or, or, mm -hmm. or, or in her career. These people stimulate her to these reflections. Mm -hmm. And of course they are about the person. Mm -hmm. um, but I could tell you all sorts of things in this book that I am personally interested in um, and that I foreground more than somebody else would. Sure, of course. That, that's inevitable. That really, we all you know, do it. No, of course. Yeah. That's inevitable and it doesn't disqualify her as a writer about, say, Canetti or whomever, right. any more than it would disqualify you writing about her. I mean, we're all sort of understanding motifs, and someone else will understand or see or pick up different motifs. I mean, you, you, know, you come at her under seeing that in what she's doing, and I think, you know, I think that that's what gives the book shape really, in many ways, and we want to see that, because there was a way, at least in your telling, and, it's, and it strikes me as very true, the way that she was, um, uh, this is probably not the best phrasing, but there was a way in which she was escaping self yes. very often, you know, in the creation of, a, well, a persona, and you know, I think you speak very eloquently yeah. about and the persona. and she does that always through literature, even when she's a little girl and she's reading, right. that's her escape from her dreary, loveless, unhappy childhood. Mm -hmm. um, so of course she continues doing that, and I find, it, um, I find it quite touching, and I find it really interesting to see how it's a use of literature. I think that the idea that you're writing something or reading something that would be outside yourself, that would be completely irrelevant to your own life, I mean, I can tell you, if that is the case, you don't finish the book. Right? right. You think, okay. <laughs> no, that's absolutely right. You know, you, you know. read things and you're touched by things and, and impressed by things and, and, and stimulated by things because they're relevant to you. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be in any kind of literal way. I mean, no, they, no, no. you know, I mean, they the, the make sense to you or they put into language some, a feeling that 
you didn't have the language for, or that you don't have the images for, and, and she's, she's definitely able to do that, and she does that very, very well. You know, what's interesting, too, is that she's not just satisfied with um, one form of image making, which yeah. is to say language. She becomes a filmmaker, and you talk quite a bit about the films that she makes. I don't think it we have fun. access to them anymore. We do, some do of them are, are on YouTube. Are they, um, are they? yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Promised Land, the one she makes in Israel, is, which is, I think, the best one. And also, um, uh, Unguided Tour, which is the film uh -huh. that she makes in Venice, I think is also on YouTube, or it's, it's on the internet. Um, one of the fascinating things about this work was when I went to Sweden, yeah, which uh -huh. is where she made the first two films in 1968. And this was actually, she was actually taken, or she was invited to Sweden to make it a film about Vietnam. That was her idea, because Sweden was one of the countries, the two main countries, along with Canada, where American draft dodgers, draft, mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm sure there's a nicer word for that, because I think these were very courageous people, and, and it, it took a lot of courage to do that. Um, there were a lot of American deserters in Stockholm, <coughs> but she got to Stockholm and she found that somebody else was already making a film about that. So she thought, oh God, what do I do? And so what she does is she makes her first film in the style or in the sort of homage to um, Ingmar Bergman, who, about whom she had written a famous essay, Persona, I mean about the film Persona. And um, these films are completely wacky. I mean, have you ever watched them? I saw duets for Cannibal yeah. a long time ago. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the first one. Yeah. Um, to say that they're unwatchable is sort of <laughs> both accurate and as a biographer, it raises questions. Yeah. Because yeah, they're yeah. really, really weird. And you think, yeah. what's going on? Like, this woman isn't like insane. Name. Like, she's not stupid. Right. Why? Yeah. And that's the biographer's question. Right, exactly. Why? Did she choose to do this this way, right? It's fascinating, and it's really fun, and that's why you know you do have to give some sort of judgment, even if it's a, just a reflection of people's befuddlement at the time. Yeah. But you. Um, what but do you mean you, your judgment? I mean, judgment yeah. of the people at the time, or judgment of you now? Well, my judgment now isn't. I don't really try to foreground that in the book about it because I wouldn't yeah. really want to watch these films if I'm honest about it. I wouldn't. No, of but course. I do want to understand. Of course not, but your job is something else. Well, that's the thing. You yeah. know, you do you have, have to job. tell what is this about and what what right. is it, and it's really challenging. I mean, it's it's easy in a certain way to write about stuff that you really like, but I think as a biographer, it's fun to try to get into the reasons why you might not like something or why you might not understand something. And what's fascinating about those films is that you see the cinematic world that she comes from. Mm a lot of which is in against interpretation and a lot of these early essays that made her seem to be a liberating figure to people because she was writing about things that people weren't writing about and people didn't really know about because you know you didn't have it on Netflix that's you know right. you had like one little cinema somewhere and if you lived in Houston or you know that's where I'm from or, or Minneapolis um, you probably didn't have it at all and you'd read about it and you'd think what is happening in Paris it was sort of thrilling Right, except there was more access. I think there were more, more movie theaters. I mean, and you there make were. the point yeah. that movies were so much part of the culture at that, you know, at a certain and time in the 60s. And cinephilia was also. Exactly, exactly. Um, people I were mean, obsessed. People were talking about, you know. And you learn stuff. She always talked about how she, you learn how to smoke, and you learn how to kiss, and you learn how to wear a raincoat, right. and all this stuff from watching From movies, film. from yeah. movies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, exactly. But there's a great thing I would encourage you, if anyone wants a homework project that'll last a year, um, as if my book isn't long enough. No, I was going to say. <laughs> I know, but it's fun. If you Google Sontag top 50 films, there's a New Yorker piece that publishes the list of those top oh, 50 really? films. Oh, really? Yeah. And What's I number one? Them. Do you remember? What? what? What was number one? I think it was Tokyo Story. Oh, maybe, that's interesting. Which is a fabulous movie. It is movie, a good movie. Which I, like I never would have watched without her. Uh -huh. um, and I watched all these movie. movies, and some of them were just breathtakingly magnificent, and I just loved them. Yeah. And some of them I really didn't understand. And the more I watched of them, the more it lets you get into the mental world that she was coming from and yeah. things that impressed her. Yeah. 
And so you think, well, you know, this is 50 years ago. People were interested in different things, and why was that? So I try yeah. to explain that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no, 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 it's interesting. Um, it, it brings me to a, a different kind of question, a research question mm -hmm. that sort of brings up. Because you're saying, okay, you went through the 50 list, and you watched, you know, these um, you know, perhaps unwatchable movies of hers, you know, or initially unwatchable. At what point do you, so you, you have this, you're taking this in, at what point do you begin to organize it in some way in your mind or on your desk in order to start making it visible to us, the reader, so that we understand it? There is a point when that becomes possible. I'm sure you know it. Well, um, I'm, I'm not the one who's sitting but I mean, in the as hot a seat. <laughs> no, but as a biographer, you know well, that you Well, as any come... kind of writer, but I'm, I'm yeah. curious when you did, because, because there's so much. There's her political writing, there's her cultural criticism, there are the movies you know, that she makes and that she writes about. There are the changes, there's you know, her looking back at on photography, there's... You know, there's a, a lot. So where... I think you start seeing the... The, the themes. Patterns? You start or? seeing the pattern. For example, one thing she's very obsessed with in these films also, um, and also in her early novels and her fiction, is mm. the image of seeing and blindness in the eye. Yes. This mm. becomes something that once you start seeing it, you start seeing it and right. you see it in everything. And you see she's really trying to see. And that's mm -hmm. in including it against interpretation. Mm -hmm. The question of how do you see, what should you look at, becomes really urgent for her. And I think that when you yeah. Um, that's one theme. I mean, you see a lot of themes, and then the point when I felt confident about the writing yeah. was never, I'll yeah. be honest. Yeah. It never But happened. you had to start. I and had to words, start, but I'll tell you, I had to end, You never feel confident, too. but you did have to start. At some point, you had to say. Yeah. Well, and you I'll had that wonderful you, vignette at the beginning. That was you, it. Um, so I'll tell you just three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I had this horrible then? nightmare. You know that I couldn't. <laughs> I realized in this dream that I couldn't change anything anymore because the book had already been printed. And it was complete agony because I have been yeah. always feeling, Revising. even to the last minute, that yeah. I maybe should do this or that. But I think that when you get to that point where you feel like, I know enough about this person that I know where to begin. Yes. And the reason that um, happens is that I found an image in the archive of her mother and grandmother at, in a, in a, as extras. Yeah. in one of the very first Hollywood spectaculars. A spectacular. You found it in the archive, just to interrupt for a minute. Is that where you found I that? I found it in the archive. Wow, it's amazing. And yeah. then I figured out what the film was and what the picture was, and that this was the last picture that was ever taken of the girl and her mother, her mother and grandmothers. And, um, and it's an image of a film called Ravished Armenia, mm -hmm. or Auction of Souls, filmed mm -hmm. in New Hall, California, if there are any Californians here, um, in Southern California in 1919 which if there are any Armenians here, you know was still in the middle of the Armenian genocide and already there was an attempt to create an artistic reenactment of this genocide um, on the other side of the world. And a lot of the people in this film, which is partially lost but partially preserved, mm -hmm. um, were actual Armenian refugees who had made it to the United States. Um, so you can, and it was too much. They had like this whole panorama of these women being crucified Mm -hmm. And all these people start fainting. And what happens is, that's not acting. It was people who had actually seen that happen back home where they were from and couldn't take it. Um, so again, you have this, it's gruesome and it's horrible, but it's also this question that comes throughout her life of how do you look at things, yeah. especially cruelty. and pain. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's a wonderful beginning, by the way, of the book. I mean, it just sort of I stands knew by it itself. When, when, when you found, found it, it, you knew that this is where you and wanted to begin. where yeah. she comes from. This question yeah. was already, yeah. it gives her a kind of genealogy, and then yeah. it goes all the way up to on photography, and then exactly. her very last essay, which is um, regarding the torture of others, of which others, is about right. Iraq, um, almost exactly 100 years later. It's amazing, really, when you think about the shape of that in that particular way. Well, it gives, you know what it does? It gives you a shape to a, sh a life that doesn't seem to have well, a shape. Well, because lives don't seem shaped, right. you know, because she's living it in that particular way. But, but yeah. it does, and in, in that sense, why it works is because 
this will sound funny, is you're not making it up. In other words, it's actually there. Somebody else would maybe take different motifs and put them together, but having done what you've done, starting in that point where, with that film and going all the way to the regarding of the torture of others, and it's regarding, it's, it creates a kind of whole and brings something but so together. so often, it's so funny, I don't know if there are aspiring biographers or, or, or sure other biographer or fellow biographers here, but one of the funny things about biography is that so much stuff happens that you wouldn't, if you were a novelist, you would not make that up. It would be too heavy-handed. You couldn't. Heavy Nobody would believe you. No, but the no idea that incredible. Susan Sontag was everywhere and saw everything and knew yeah. everyone and slept with everyone, all, all these things. You think, okay, well, that's sort of cheesy, you know? <laughs> and yet, like, when the Berlin Wall falls, she's in a movie theater in Berlin. Yeah. And as she's walking out of the film, almost as if they had sort of waited for her to be finished with the film, the East German border guards open the floodgates that have been closed for almost, what, 35, yeah. 30 years. Um, and she smells the tear gas coming from the, the rioting hordes of East Germans escaping East Germany. If you were a novelist trying to write about yeah. somebody who was everywhere and did everything, you would be like, no, oh, that's no. a little much. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd lose all credibility in that sense. But what's interesting, though, about where she is, you know, that she happens to be there, you mm. know, on the spot. One of the interesting things sort of later in the book, and, and it becomes problematic, I think, for the way people respond to her, um, is 9-11. Yeah. You know, um, it's closer, it's still 18 years ago, but... You know, but it's people who are in college now don't remember it. Yeah, I mean that. Isn't that that's weird? right. No, that's exactly right. But she wasn't here. Well, she was also in Berlin, and it's fascinating that she writes over and over about how yeah. you actually, if you if you haven't seen something yourself, if you haven't actually experienced it's, it's it. It's such an interesting metaphor in, in it's some way. It's amazing. Yeah. So in the book, I even have a picture of CNN, of the guy on CNN looking at the twin towers with the smoke coming out. Because she was in the Adlon, you know, which is right by the Brandenburg Gate in central Berlin, watching this on TV. And she wrote this essay that I think, I must say, is a really good essay. Um, well, one of the interesting things, by the way, about that essay, and then we should talk, I mean, we haven't said what it is, but the, the first sentence I didn't realize was cut. Was cut. Yeah, I mean, that changes everything, doesn't it? It changes everything, but she, she refers to herself as a heartbroken American and New Yorker or something. Um, it was a time, just for those of us who are less old than I am, um, when there was... Younger. Uh, the word. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a birthday, so I'm sort of... Happy birthday. You know, thank you. I'm, I'm sort of edging towards more old rather than younger, but the... Um, it happened to me, this horrible cataclysm that had not happened in the United States for since 1941, and certainly never right. in the mm -hmm. city in the middle of the empire, um, was the most shocking bit of anything that I think happened in this country in my lifetime. And it was absolutely um, not a time when there was any sense of nuance in the culture because people were wounded. People were physically dead and yeah. wounded. And the city stank. I mean, I, right. I don't know if people remember that as well as they might should, but it was for weeks and weeks and weeks. And there was this smell and these dead bodies and this toxicity. And then people started sending anthrax to the White House. And I mean, it was just absolutely uh -huh. terrifying. And, um, and she wrote an essay that basically said that these people were not cowards. Um, and terrorists. That the terrorists who had yeah. hijacked these planes and killed themselves in this spectacular fashion were not cowards. And that the United States, rather than lashing out at other countries and starting a new war, should look to why people hated America. And this was something that Americans have always had a hard time understanding, that America is this very ferocious, extremely violent empire, yeah. which it has been since day one, really. I mean, and, and if you go back to 1619, um, which I'm happy that we are now going back to, I'm sure we'll, um, you know that this is a country that is in many ways built on cruelty and slavery and, 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 and racism, at, like every other country, I should yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I've yeah. lived in Europe for most of my life, and I have to say, like, America compared to France or England or Germany or Italy, you know, 
we've got our stuff, so do they. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not no, maybe exactly. worse than China or India, but still, if you, uh, yeah. the, the physical, emotional wound that yeah. this was meant that it was very hard to say anything, and it, but it was, I think, very salutary to say something, but the attacks, I mean, she was compared in the New Republic, which is, you know, usually a pretty, um, what's the word? Liberal? Liberal-esque, liberal-ish. Well, in the two, and then, two, you know, in 2001. Yeah, then it was yeah, still. Yeah. But you know, the New Republic compared or, yeah. her to Osama bin Laden. Um, that I mm. Yeah. I mean, this was at the time, and so I, I really think that when you look at her legacy also, and you think about what can she mean for us now, there's a need for intellectuals to resist mm -hmm. jargon, mm -hmm. especially at these times mm -hmm. when everybody agrees. Because everybody in America and everybody around the world agreed that this was an absolutely horrifying, mm -hmm. just there are no words to describe it. Mm -hmm. And it's specifically, I think, at those times that you need the mm -hmm. adversarial voice. Mm -hmm. And I mean, now everybody has an adversarial voice because everybody's on Twitter yelling at each other all the time. <laughs> you know, and that's really different than actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you need that ability to step back, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's interesting. But it's interesting, too, because as they go back, you know, when, when they cut, I wonder why they cut that first sentence, because it, mm. it, you know, of the piece, because it does orient it. You know, she is saying, it, you know, I am feeling, and then goes beyond that, you know, to be kind of analytical about, yeah. you know, this isn't isolated. This didn't come out of nowhere. It's, right. it's not an act of randomness, you know, in that particular but that's sense. Fine. I mean, that's what a thinker does, is, yeah. is, is, is not, because it's very easy to denounce terrorism. I mean, that's yeah. not that original. No, but, you know, but, what, but let me just sort of shift a little bit, because it's related, but slightly different, and I want to get to this point, too, because one one of the things you talk about, and I think you know, you, you'll see why sort of the connection I'm making. One of the things you talk about is um, her um, need for and lack of, at times, empathy, yeah. which I think is itself an interesting motif in the book. And I guess in that essay, it's the I, I agree with you. It's important to have that kind of analysis that she offers, but sometimes at, it, there's a way in which it needs to be, um, it, it needs to be woven with a kind of empathy at the same time. Well, um, one of the really challenging things about writing about Sontag was that question, because there's no question at all that Sontag was a very herself often an incredibly cruel person. Yeah. Um, and this was something that she um, performed almost in public mm. to her loved ones, you know, including Annie Leibovitz and including her son. Her son. Um, she could be absolutely brutal to people and she could humiliate people. Yeah. And, you know, if you've lived in New York and you've known these stories, everybody had a story like that. Yeah to the point where for me as the biographer and someone who's on her side and wants to understand her and wants to sort of figure out what she's thinking and why she's doing this, it becomes really oppressive yeah. um, to, to hear all those stories. And you know they're true. At the same time, you know the heroic great stories are true. Um, and in the 9-11 piece, as she was, what she was accused of was being insensitive to yeah. what people were feeling. And there is a way in which I like the adversarial side of that. But then someone told me, oh, after 9-11, she said she didn't care about all the bankers in the World Trade right, Center. Right, exactly. She just cared, cared just about the West about restaurant the rest workers. people who yeah, worked in the restaurants or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and, and this woman well, who told second. me this said, wait, like, Why you don't care about... Why make those distinctions, <laughs> you know? You know, the banker who dead. jumped 100 stories to his death on live yeah. television? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't... And the empathy is something that goes throughout her work. Um, she's often trying to write her way into empathy rather than actually feel things uh, mm. intuitively. And it's very painful for her not to have that. She knows she doesn't have it. She yeah. writes about it. And the, the result is that people say, oh, she slept with everyone. She had all these lovers. Isn't that interesting? 
because um, they're kind of jealous or something, maybe. <laughs> like they wish I they slept with or Bobby Kennedy or with you know whatever. But maybe they wanted to have slept with her, and that's well. The a lot of people that, didn't know. want to, yeah. um, of course, because she was so beautiful. But I think that when you look at the um, what you look at what that actually means in somebody's life, having a whole lot of relationships yeah. means that you have a whole lot of broken relationships. It means mm -hmm. that That's time and time again it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And this was a real source of pain for her. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's interesting because, it, because I find it, um, I, I mean, it, it is a source of pain. It is something that she wrestles with. It's something that you as biographer have to wrestle with. And then beyond that, it becomes interesting for the biographer. In other words, I think what you're saying too is that there's a way in which a the precondition, if you will, of a biographer is to have empathy, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, and Sontag demands, as a biographer, she demands a lot of empathy. Do you think she could have been a biographer? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I think probably not. Yeah. I think probably not, also because the, if maybe, it's related to some of her problems with fiction also. Mm, yeah, that's because interesting. Because fiction is an art of empathy. Yes. And it's an art of, um, it's not really a rational thing. Right. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why people who write, I don't like the word nonfiction, but we'll just use it. Um, there is a different sensibility between the person who writes fiction and the person who writes nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, I think, at its base, a need to go into somebody. And Sontag, for me, was somebody that I had to go into time and time again mm -hmm. and really try to step back and try to rise above mm -hmm. the emotions that she unleashed in people. Or in you. Or in me. Yeah. Um, because often, I'm, again, I'm on her side. I want to understand it. She makes it tough sometimes. I bet. You know, um, I, I bet. Oh, how did you deal with it? Walk away? Go to a different chapter? Um, no, I actually wrote it straight on through, yeah. strangely enough. Yeah. No. How did I deal with it? Um, I kept trying to understand her mm. and think, why is she doing this? Mm -hmm. And why is she doing this? And why is she doing this? Mm -hmm. And I didn't always have the explanation. And often with Sontag, because she was so polemical, you would have the same dinner party. <laughs> and you would have one yeah. story about it in which she was great. Yeah. And the other story was that yeah. she was this terrible person. So what I tried to do a little bit in the book was just say, okay, yeah. Brenda Wineapple says X, Y, Z. <laughs> Benjamin Moser, however, yeah. remembers ABC. Yes. Right. And not really try to be in there myself to the extent that the emotional stuff Well, to me. not to the extent the emotional stuff is, then you have to navigate, I guess that's a contemporary yeah. word for it, it's a word I don't like, but it works, but in that sense. But at the same time, you do have a very strong voice. Mm. In other words, there, I think by, for me, biographies that don't work because are, they don't work because there is no voice. And I don't mean an I voice, mm. like, you know, I'm Ben Moser and I'm gonna tell you this, you know, in, yeah. in the first person. But, but in the sense of, we're very clear that there are times when you're separating yourself out from um, what she is doing or what she thinks she's doing or even maybe what other people think she's doing. And yeah. you are making, um, you have a point of view, let me say that. Well, I thought she would like that. I thought that, um, <laughs> I thought she was not, I thought a book about Susan Sontag that was boring and that wasn't argumentative to a certain extent would yeah. not be a book about Susan Sontag. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, so you're, yeah. in that sense, you're engaging with her. Engaging. Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. Talking, talking back or talking with, and talking back sometimes and talking yeah. with sometimes. You well, know? I think that gives it, I hope that my engagement with her is palpable and that it's something well, it's that people. It's definitely palpable. Um, and that people, I don't want everybody to agree with every conclusion I have about Susan. I don't even know if conclusion is the right word, but mm -hmm. um, because I don't necessarily want to have the last word. But um, I'd like the conversation to go on. Yeah. Do you think it will with Susan? Yeah. Son? Do you think people will reinvent her, reread her? Do you? It's already happening. Is it? It's so funny to read the reviews. You know, you get all the. Um, I could write these reviews myself. If could you, or couldn't? I could. Uh. If you gave me the <laughs> stats, you know, you could say like, 
Maybe you should. Whitman wrote his own reviews. <laughs> you want to read these? That's true. Right? Well, because you know, I mean, Just I'll tell saying. you one thing, one example <laughs> that I, could, I, could, I knew everyone was going to hate this, um, was I talk a lot about what the classic Jewish intellectual yeah. Freudian person would hate, which is what they call pop psychology. Right, right, right. Um, I write a lot about the fact that her mother was an alcoholic, and right, I write a lot right. about the well, fact that she was gay and in the closet. Now, these are things that were not understood at the time. Right. Um, what parental alcoholism, yeah, yeah. They did, people didn't know about it. It right. wasn't something that existed. And I knew, I knew that this would trigger people. Huh. Because I know that people don't often take seriously 12-step um, stuff. Uh, they the they the do alcoholism. take um, the mind of the moralist and, and, and you know, right, the interpretation right, right. of dreams. That is, is OK. Yeah. But they look yeah. down on Right, right, right. That. It's this sort of, yeah, yeah, pecking order of uh, what's intellectually respectable. And, well, it's yeah. very funny. And it's, it's a similar thing you could say about something like going to yoga or, or exercising. You think, you should exercise more. You'd feel better. <laughs> so obvious. Yeah. And yet, if you put that in an intellectual biography of an intimidating seeming thinker, People would say, oh, come on. But you know in your own life that actually, like, right. would it, be, you feel better if you yeah. sleep more. Yeah, yeah, which she didn't. She didn't. Well, she told Camille Paglia, who is, has a great cameo in this. Um, yeah. She says to her, oh, you know, well, if you're having trouble writing, just what I do to finish my essays, I just stay up for two weeks. <laughs> and you think. Oh, my God. you think Because she took amphetamines, <laughs> yeah. which actually, like, my own mother says, you have to remember, like, my doctor gave me amphetamines to study for my SATs. Like, she got speed. People got it to lose weight. People got it to concentrate. And actually, a lot of things that are given to treat ADD and stuff, it's basically right, it's still basically amphetamines. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And this was something whose dangers weren't quite as understood as they would later be. So um, you're not trying to judge it, necessarily. Right. You're just trying to kind of right. set the parameters so that people can understand why. There's you know, something you just said, and I just want to read something so that people have the sort of um, benefit of your beautiful prose. And, um, and, and because it, it, I think the end of the book speaks to, and I'm not going to give away anything, not to worry, but um, it speaks to what you said before, that you know, yours is not necessarily the last yeah. word on uh, Susan Sontag. And, I think you know um, what Ben is able to do is bring together a number of the themes, some of which we're talking about tonight, um, but also in such a way um, that it's so very nice, too, because it brings us back to the issue of biography. And then maybe we'll get some questions about this. And this is um, what Ben writes. To a divided world, she br brought a divided self. But if she herself was one with her age, her greatest theme stood apart from it. Aristotle had written that metaphor consists in giving the thing a name that belongs to something else. And Sontag showed how metaphor formed and then deformed the self, how language could console and how it could destroy, how representation could comfort while also being obscene, why even a great interpreter ought to be against interpretation. And she warned against the mystification of photographs and portraits, including those of biographers which is a really very nice um, sort of wonderful pin to the kind of extent and limits of biography and it sort of opens the door. So with that lovely last paragraph, let me just open, there may be some other people besides me who want to ask questions of Ben. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, if Susan Sontag could read my book right now, what would she have to say? Well, I can just tell you that I don't know, but it's <laughs> definitely something I thought about 24 hours a day when I was writing it. I wanted her to feel fairly treated. I wanted her to feel, to a certain sense, understood. I wanted to argue with her, mm. but I sort of wanted her to be like. enjoying the conversation because she was a great polemicist. She was a great talker. She was a great arguer. Um, I hope that she would feel that with the access I had mm -hmm. to her stuff, we didn't really talk oh, about yeah. like the fact that I was allowed to see her computer 
and go through her email and go through just everything personal that, that I was respectful of that access and I didn't, um, I didn't treat her um, sensationalistically. Mm -hmm. um, that she would see that I tried to understand her and that, I, that she saw really that I'm trying to bring her work into a new generation. Mm -hmm. Into these generation of people who don't remember 9-11. So we, the world moves fast, and I think one of the things that she was able to do, which is take a step back and kind of take another look at things and give a, a bit more comprehension to things that seemed incomprehensible, mm -hmm. that maybe this can be a key to a whole world of culture and politics and sexuality mm -hmm. and economics and everything that she witnessed and that she helped shape. So that's what I hope. She made the form and she broke it. This yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, I just thought that her look was so striking, yeah. the way she presented herself and just her, her appearance. Um, so I grew up in Jamaica. I didn't know too much about her until I came to New York. And I actually didn't know she was gay until Leibowitz had that uh, photographic exhibition in Chelsea somewhere, and I didn't know that there were partners. I just wondered, how do you think her looks, her appearance, contributed to her affect? Well, that's a fantastic question that interests me deeply, because Sontag's great theme is the difference between the photograph, the metaphor, and the person behind it. So what people think about you, what you give off, and who you actually are, and with Sontag, in Notes on Camp, she writes that, you know, it's not, camp is not a woman, but a woman, in mm. quotes. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a lot about the difference between Susan Sontag, or Sue, as she calls herself, this little girl, and Susan Sontag, this tower of power who knew everything and went everywhere and wrote everything and read every book and went to every opera. Um, the appearance of Sontag becomes a kind of story of its own. One of the things that I was really proud of, which sounds kind of cheesy, but I can dress it up and make it sound fancier, um, but it was just really fun as a biographer, is that I found the guy in Honolulu who oh. gave her the white streak in her hair. Yeah. Oh. Which, you know. I thought it was natural. Yes, well, in the book, you will discover that it was oh, I did too. created in a I did salon too. I thought, yeah. in Honolulu. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah her, she her had mother's chemo. Stylist, yeah. Well, her mother, who is this, like, fancy Jewish lady with, like, earrings and hair and lipstick and look perfect all the time, um, her best friend was her hairdresser. He actually oh. emailed me today and said, mahalo, which is Hawaiian for thank you, if you are familiar. <laughs> um, because I talked about him in this yeah. piece in the Times, and he was excited about it. Her hair went white when she had chemo in 1975. Oh. Um, she didn't lose her hair, but she lost the color in her hair. Oh. And, she, um, yeah. and she went to visit her mother when she was recovered, and she was a wreck physically. You know, she was, I mean, she'd gone through almost three years of chemotherapy and almost died. Um, and her mom said, let's go to the hairdresser, which she was always trying to get her to do anyway. Um, and Paul, the hairdresser, said, you know, why don't we just like, leave part of it white and yeah, dye the rest of it black? Idea. And she said, sure. And this is a conversation that probably took two seconds. And then this image of the white streak, it really became, I, I'm trying to think of whose hair would have been more famous than Susan's. It was, you know, you would definitely say Elvis. <laughs> um, you'd say maybe Andy Warhol or Dolly well, Parton. I have one, Angela Davis. Yeah. Angela Davis. Yeah, that's a good one. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, but it's a pretty short list. And in fact, there was a right. wig in the Saturday Night Live yeah. costume department with the white streak, and it just symbolized the New York intellectual. You could right. put it on, and everybody yeah. knew it was Susan Sontag. <laughs> and so, um, but that becomes really oppressive for her. And the sure. things that people pro project onto that is, are scary, just like anyone knows. Um, Anyone even moderately public, yeah. like us, you know, we're like, it's, we publish books, but we're not like, yeah, you know, that's Elvis hard. Presley. Yeah. Um, people said horrible, horrible things about her that were compl 
completely untrue all the time. And it's really, this was before Twitter, you know, this was. Feel entitled, yeah. Feel entitled because you're a public person to say anything about the person, to, you know, attack them in any way. Mm -hmm. But it also is the theme of on photography, which I think is her great collection. I mean, mm -hmm. for me, it's still the most resonant yeah. collection because it's about the difference between the person and the image of the person and how the image can take over the person and, and, and destroy the person. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like it's about cosmetics, mm -hmm. but it's funny that oh, yeah. so many of the famous women writers have always taken that theme seriously. Um, right. Because they know what it does to your life, trying to live up to the photograph. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I think there's some others. I can see you, but you'll have to sh shout. Or go up to the mic. Or go to the mic. mic. Oh, here's someone there's coming to the mic here. Oh. You go first. You're, you're closer. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. It's a very brief question. Uh, you know, I happen to be from the from Montclair, and I'm just curious about, I guess, her gran her gran her grandmother. Yeah. So, uh, what was the family name, and uh, you know, that of that side of her family, and do you know anything about? Uh, her grandmother's growing up, or what the family did in that Montclair Verona yeah. area. I think it was actually Verona, but it was sort of on the right, border next town. Um, right. Yeah, but it was right there. And I know her. So her, interestingly enough, um, both of her grandparents were born in Poland. I mean, on her mother's side of the family, mm -hmm. um, but they came to the United States very young. And so, in an age where most Jews in this country had foreign parents or grandparents, her. Even her grandparents were basically American. Right. Um, the name was Rosenblatt. Um, oh, Rosenblatt. On that, okay. Actually, on that side of the family, it was, um, no, what was Mildred's maiden name? Um, with, begin with an L? Am I, I'm blocking on it. I don't know. Oh, uh, anyway. Um, uh, well, I, it's in the book, anyway. Right. Um, yeah. her, <laughs> what is Jacobson. It? Jacobson. Jacobson. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, um, so. Her grandfather, Jacobson, had a sporting goods store on Oh, the my God, street. really? Well, that's where I bought my first baseball mitt and uh, bat and all that. Jacobson, was it called? Yeah, it's quite a famous, at least in my generation, was a very famous store. And I always thought they were Scandinavian, but. Uh, huh? <laughs> they were that's Jews funny. like us. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> Jews like that's us. That's my next book. Yeah, Jews like um, us. Yeah, no, it was, um, no, uh, that was her grandfather's store, but then they had moved to California. Mm -hmm. um, and then when her mm -hmm. grandmother died, they came back to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And. Um, yeah. Right, right. But they died when she was pretty young, so she didn't right. have. I mean, her grandmother died before she was born. Right. I, see, I see. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, thanks That's very a much. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Go to the microphone. Hi. I'll use the microphone. Um, what was the biggest difference in who you thought she was at the beginning and who? you thought she was at the end? And were they the same person? Well, that is almost like the image of the person versus the actual person. Mm. Um, I think that when you write biographies, you definitely, if you're about to embark on this thing, mm -hmm. you know enough about the person that you're not ignorant of the person. Obviously, right. you wouldn't do it if you didn't know something. something. But the difference is so vast mm -hmm. between, and I had this with Clarice Lispector too, mm -hmm. the, the person you think she is and then the person, it's not the person she actually is, it's the person that she actually is for you after mm -hmm. going through this process. Um, yeah. And so I would say maybe the biggest difference for me would be the difference between how vulnerable she was mm. and how nervous and insecure she was behind this facade of assurance. and majesty, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, she just looked so certain, and she was so impressive, and she was so cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. and she was so sophisticated, mm -hmm. and just really a tiny little scratch beneath the surface, and you found this other person. Very vulnerable, yeah. Very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that she's so interesting also, yeah. because behind that, uh, she seems so intimidating to people. Mm -hmm. um, and people were put off by her. I, I was, when I was teaching at UCLA, when I was doing this um, the research there, I, I was teaching a class on Latin American literature, which was really fun. And um, this girl in my class said, oh, I talked to my mother about Susan Sontag. And 
And the mother said, well, you know, like I never really identified with her because she's like, I'm just like a middle class Mexican housewife from California. She always seemed like this mm. enormous figure that I couldn't really approach. And now I hope, maybe I'm actually, I should email that girl and say, okay, now give her my book and yeah. maybe your mom will now understand that she wasn't actually as different from other right. people as she may have seemed. Yeah. In that if way. If people could go to the mics over yeah, it would here. Be better if yeah. you didn't sort of scoot over. That way everybody can hear. Right. I see. Oh, here you are. I see you now. Okay. Thank you. Sure. That she what? Left her son. Left her son. Well, that's interesting. Are you a mother? I'm a Jewish grandmother. Okay. <laughs> well. Um, uh, I, I camp. I didn't hear the last part, but I. Oh, yes, yes, oh. that's true. The mother thing is fascinating to me because there's actually an excellent essay by Leslie Jameson in the New Republic about yeah. this this week, if you know her. Mm -hmm. And Leslie um, has a very young daughter, mm -hmm. who's I think two. Mm -hmm. And it is true that Susan, when she was mm -hmm. 19, had her first child and her only child. Um, and 19, if you see the pictures in the book, she looks like she's 12. Yeah. I mean, it really is shocking to think, oh my God, she's you can just see the horror. Like, what do I do with this person um, when she herself was in the middle of creating her own person of herself? She leaves her husband and she goes to Europe on a scholarship when he is five. Um, and she stays away for more than a year. And a lot of women at the time, her friends, and now, including Leslie Jameson this week, were very judgmental about that and thought, how could you possibly leave this tiny little kid and go off and have a love affair in Paris? Um, well, I think actually a lot of, as, as, I mean, I don't have children, my sister has small children, and I think that, you know, whose grandparents are also here, um, I don't think my sister would leave her kids for a year and go to Paris and have a love affair, but I can definitely think being around these kids all the time, the temptation, you know, I understand it. But like, <laughs> Leslie was fascinating about <laughs> how the temptation to judge this yeah. was something that she needed to pull back on, pull back from. Because it's very hard, I think, when you look at the, some of what, for example, Annie Leibovitz, um, did not perceive to be cruelty that other people did. did yeah. um, when I spoke to Annie about that, she kind of shrugged. And you know, Annie Leibovitz is one of the most powerful, influential, successful women in America. She's been at the top of her career for 50 years. She's anything but a doormat. And so to portray her as this kind of sad housewife mm. with the husband who drinks too much and beats her up, it's just not who Annie Leibovitz is. It has nothing to do with her. Mm -hmm. So people project onto it. Right. And I think it's really important not to project onto people as a biographer as well, because the temptation is always there. And I think that people do things for so many reasons. And um, I think Susan really, more than she needed to take care of her child, she needed to get out of that marriage. Mm -hmm. And that was the way she did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I think, yeah, one more question. Or, right. So on that note, I just want to press you a little bit on your decision in the biography to label her as gay and a closeted gay woman. Um, for a life that was so interested in kind of defying genre and defying conventions and, you know, resisting labels, um, I just, I want to I want to ask you, you know, how you, I guess, to pick up on the previous question, kind of, 
how you feel that you can claim her in a way that she did not claim herself, and what the ethics are of that for you. I mean, it seems like that would be something you would really have to grapple with in a biography of Sontag, of all people, um, as you mentioned, thinking about you know the photograph, the person, and the person behind it. Um, labeling her in a way that she chose very actively and consciously not to, to identify with seems like a controversial decision, and so I just wanted to press you on that. Well, it is a controversial decision, absolutely, and I'm glad you asked me that because it's a very hard thing to do. I mean, for, I can answer that in several ways. The first way is that um, she was gay. I mean, if you read 100 volumes of her journals and you talk to, she, she does every once in a while, she sleeps with a man, but it's very clear that her emotional investment is in women. Her real relationships are with women. Her, the people she falls in love with are women. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is I think that if you are Jewish, if you're female, if you're black, if you're gay, if you're whatever, we all know that labels are not all of us. And we know that if you're in a minority, and especially a minority that people don't like, like Jews or gays or, or whatever, that having a label affixed to you is very dangerous. It can be physically dangerous. I mean, gay people get killed every day all over the world. Um, it's not the entirety of anyone's identity, but I think that what happens when Sontag is a young woman, and this is why I'm not judging it, um, she grows up in a completely, it's not even a homophobic society, it's a society where gay people do not exist mm -hmm. right. at all. And that's really important. I mean, I say in the book, like, yeah. people were shocked to learn that Liberace was gay. That is a true story. <laughs> um, this was, the culture was so closeted that there was no visibility right. for that at all. And, um, and at the same time, um, I don't know where, I can't see the, we have lights here, but I, someone said that she didn't know she was a lesbian. Well, actually, the other th side of that is that lesbians did know she was a lesbian. Right. And they were existing in a world where they didn't have any role models at all. And sh they really, not just women intellectuals, but lesbian intellectuals specifically idolized her because she represented a kind of possibility. Um, I, I talked to this one woman who was at Columbia and she was this young woman, you know, maybe 19 or 20, and she was gay, and this was like the early 60s, and she told me about the first time she saw Susan Sontag walking across the campus and how gorgeous she was and how glamorous she was in this, and she said the first time, like, I realized that I could be gay and I could be myself and I could be a woman and I could also be a professor and I could write books, and, and she did go on to do those things, and um, the really important thing to say is that this was sort of in the realm of hypothesis until AIDS. Yeah. And what happened with AIDS is not only did it kill 40 million people, plus still counting dying every day, um, much more invisibly than they did, but that imposed a label mm -hmm. on people that would not have wanted that label because it was a disease that was associated right. with sex and it was a disease that was associated with gayness, and gay sex specifically. Um, I think when we look back at the pioneers, because I'm very, I have a kind of filial piety for, you know, I love, even when I was a little kid, I loved the great freedom fighters. You know, I'm sort of romantic and idealistic in this way. I loved, I have a dream, and I loved like the guys in the Warsaw ghetto, and I loved all this kind of stuff that now is slightly embarrassing, but <laughs> I have absolute veneration as a gay person for the gay people who came before me mm -hmm. and who made my life completely boring in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Like nobody mm -hmm. in my world mm -hmm. cares that I'm gay. Right. But I think it's important to realize people did care and this was a label. So I'm not trying to label her, I'm just trying to record the facts of her life and then show how those mm -hmm. labels, just like these other metaphors, could liberate that and also destroy. destroy. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks, a great well, place to end. Uh, I, this has been a fabulous conversation, but we do have to wrap it up. And I'm going to take the opportunity to ask the last question Great. because I'm just curious okay. about your um, distinction between the role uh, being designated the uh, authorized biographer, but not the authorized biography. That's a really nice distinction, I think. But it leads me to ask, you got access, mm -hmm. I guess, as the authorized biographer yeah. mm -hmm. to these fabulous journals, which is you know, any biographer's dream to get that kind of material. Did, was there any pushback from, I guess it's the son who gives 
this the will may, is this, including. Yeah. Was there any? Afterwards. Afterwards, uh, any attempt to say, well, you really shouldn't be using this, or, uh, or is he unhappy with the book? No, is I mean, he... there was a sort of moment where, um, I mean, first of all, so I had an agreement that was negotiated, and it was lawyers and agents. And oh, so it was we, a written agreement. A written agreement at the beginning that I would have this authorization, that he would have the right to read it, and other people would also have the right to read it and give comments. Um, and I liked those comments, actually, because um, I think it's useful. Mm -hmm. And often, you get stuff wrong, you just do. It's 800 pages long, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, to have other readers is, is extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons I was attracted to it, because I knew about the controversy about her, I knew the electricity that surrounds Sontag, and I thought, like, I really don't know if I want to step into the middle of that, you know. But he said to me, David said to me, just so you're clear, like, I'm not going to like this book. <laughs> um, it's not my mother, it's your version of it. And I thought that was so smart to yeah. say that. Right. He said that at the beginning? At the very beginning, he said, I haven't written, I haven't read a word. Mm -hmm. um, I might not even read it. Um, I just want you to know that, so we're clear that I know that I'm not gonna like it. And um, I thought that was really mature of him because the thing about biography is that you don't really, aren't really prepared for it. So you can do all this stuff, You can always be thinking about the person, always trying to take into consideration, always trying to be fair, always this. People are going to get offended by stuff mm -hmm. that you do not see coming. Um, someone got offended by this line in, uh, about Clarice Lispector's clothes after her divorce. Mm -hmm. It was like the least controversial thing in this book. It's like she started dressing differently. Or I don't even remember what it was, but people were outraged. And I thought, like, like all this like Twitter reactions, you just never know what it's going to be. And so I think that if you are in a state, or if you're somebody who might have a biography written about someone close to you, really understand that this is not her. This mm -hmm. is a book. It's a narrative. It's a metaphor. metaphor. <laughs> it's not her. <laughs> exactly. So um, this isn't. is my version of her, just like that's a photograph by Richard Avedon. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's not her. But I hope it does bring people closer to her, and I hope that she inspires you to read her work and to go back to it and, and, and move her move her spirit forward into new generations and into new uh, thoughts. So thanks everyone thank so you. much. Oh, thank you.